ago, uh, we got a note from uh, Temple Beth Hillel Beth El that uh, they were had going to have a tour of Morocco escorted by Rabbi Cooper. And uh, we were former members of the synagogue before we joined BZBI and we thought that would be great. And so we joined the group of people. Uh, the tour was being uh, run by Ayala Tours out of New York, which specializes in Jewish heritage tours. And uh, they have many types of Jewish heritage tours with uh, speakers and excellent guides from uh, all over uh, the world that you can take with them. So we joined the uh, Bethel Bethel tour with Rabbi Cooper. And uh, we even had a lecture prior to going with a scholar from Penn. And uh, we originally had a large group of people that were gonna go with us, but because of the scares with COVID about a week before the trip, uh, a number of them decided not to go with us. And so we had a group of 21 of us going on this trip to Morocco. Uh, Penny and I used our miles and we flew an American from Philly through uh, Madrid uh, to Casablanca and we got there the night before the rest of the group which came um, in the morning uh, direct flying from New York on Air Morocco and the very first thing um, that they did was go to the Jewish uh, Museum in Casablanca and that's where Penny and I met them and we got to learn a little bit and we can start with the slides David uh, we got the um, uh, got there to meet them at the Jewish Museum to get a little introduction to the country. Uh, the, the, the Morocco is on the edge of the Arab world, as most of you know. It's, it is exotic and progressive at the same time. And it, politically, it's quite moderate uh, with its own stance to uh, the Jews, uh, which is an ingrained Jewish community uh, there in Morocco. Uh, the uh, Jews interact with Moroccan subjects on virtually every level of the country, diplomatic, outfitting the military, uh, tending to the king's medical needs, and members of the Jewish community have served as advisors and uh, ministers and cabinet uh, people to the various kings, especially the last three kings. The Jewish community has been very active into the economic aspects of the country. So um, there are a lot of things about the, as we go along in this talk that I'll mention uh, about the country and the Jews and its relationship. The king has a very good relationship with the Jewish community. It is uh, so good that on the Yisker anniversaries of the current king's grandfather and father, Yisker prayers are mentioned for the grandfather and the father of, of the current king, that is uh, king, king Muhammad the, the fifth and Hassan the second, which who is his father. You're looking at an evening scene of Casablanca and that's the uh, Hassan the second mosque uh, at night and we'll see it in the daytime. And this mosque is the second largest mosque in uh, the world after Mecca and it can hold 85,000 people or so uh, inside and around on the patio. So this is Morocco. So as I said, next slide, David, uh, uh, the first stop was to the Jewish Museum. And right in the entranceway to the Jewish Museum was this particular sign, which shows the uh, addition to the uh, preamble the, of the constitution that was done in 2000. 2011, and this is what uh, the preamble states. And if you'll notice in the last line that it's nurtured and enriched by the African, Andalusian, Hebraic, and Mediterranean constituents. So the Jews and the Hebraic community are definitely members uh, listed directly into the Constitution as citizens of the country. And uh, the next slide, please. So that we went into the uh, Jewish Museum in, in Morocco. This is the only Jewish museum in an Arab country. And uh, it's a, not a large museum, it's in a building that was a former orphanage for Jewish children. And uh, it was built uh, in, um, let me get to my notes, the exact, uh, in 1997, it was dedicated. Uh, it was funded partly by the king as well as, uh, as the Jewish community. And that was makes it very interesting. Next slide, David. Um, 
The artifacts are typical of Jewish museums. These are uh, rimonim that were made in Morocco um, by the craftsmen that were there. The Jews were very good craftsmen within the community. And I just, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a reconstructed ark from one of the synagogues that no longer exist in, in Morocco, but they put this in the museum so people could see what it, it is, a beam and ark from that synagogue. And unfortunately, I didn't write down the name, so I can't tell you. Next slide, please. So, um, but after we left the museum, and we spent quite a bit of time looking at um, wedding gowns of Jewish women, costumes, jewelry, and lots of other artifacts of the Jewish community uh, in this museum. We then drove around uh, the city a little bit, uh, driving through the upscale neighborhoods. The, the museum actually is in a fairly upscale neighborhood with most of the houses behind walls. And we, we drove around on the streets. Uh, we didn't see too much because the houses were on the walls, but they all looked like very, very nice houses. That, that you would see. Uh, we came to the beach area, which was uh, lined with um, restaurants and clubs. Um, there is a Jewish club here on the beach. Unfortunately, it was, uh, you know, we were early March and it wasn't open because it wasn't that warm, but we did stop here, have some coffee. And in the distance is the Hassan II mosque uh, that's in the city. And that's the older part of the city. So. Uh, we then uh, drove through these uh, areas. We didn't go directly into the Jewish quarter of Casablanca because we were going to go into some of the other quarters uh, that were a little bit much more picturesque and there's nobody living in the Jewish quarter. I think there is a kosher butcher shop and a bakery still there, but otherwise it, there aren't any J uh, Jewish um, people uh, in, the, in that area. Um, then it was time for our, uh, the travelers who were coming, who didn't have a night's sleep to get to the hotel and rest before dinner. Next slide, please. Uh, so, oh, this is, uh, this is a typical building in the Jewish area that I took. And it shows balconies and windows facing the street. This is typical of the Jewish quarter as compared to the Arab areas, which did not have windows facing the street and they had interior courtyard windows. Uh, but the Jewish quarter so that we came would have outside facing windows. Uh, next, please. Um, oh, I forgot this. We, one of the places we stopped at was a palace that was in the heart of Casablanca. This is some of the decorations on this palace wall, the intricate carvings within in the, the tiles, the mosaics and things like that. Next slide, please. This, this palace was used for the Casablanca Conference in 1941, where uh, Roosevelt met um, de Gaulle and Churchill to discuss what's gonna be happening, excuse me, 1943, where they met to discuss uh, what was gonna be happening after the war ended with uh, Germany and Italy and Japan. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so that evening after resting, we went to the synagogue because it was Purim, Erev Purim, and we went to hear the Megillah. So this is Bet El Synagogue in Casablanca. It's the largest synagogue in the country, seats 500 people. And um, in, in Morocco, the Jews, about a third uh, are observant, but about half keep kosher. But this, this particular synagogue we went into, next slide, please. Um, this is the interior of the synagogue. I took this before the holidays started as we entered. Um, and there weren't, there weren't many people at Purim services. I, I don't think we had 40 people, maybe not much more than that, if uh, I'm sure. But uh, this is the interior of Bethel Synagogue. It's a beautiful synagogue with stained glass windows. Uh, and that's the ark. And another picture, please. And this is the women's balcony that was above uh, where the women sat from our group uh, and to listen to the Megillah. The Megillah reading was extremely fast. Uh, only one person had a grogger to make noise with the name of Haman. So he made noise and nobody was dressed in costumes. I understand that in other synagogues in Casablanca, 
it was a little different story where they had uh, big celebrations of people and uh, it was very festive and uh, it was uh, different. And Casablanca has um, 15 functioning synagogues. Many of them are privately owned synagogues. And um, as, as we were getting into the COVID virus, one of the synagogues called David HaMelech had a lot of people celebrating, especially who had come to France for a wedding uh, on Thursday, were celebrating. And it was thought that was the start of a COVID outbreak within the Jewish community that came after, after us. Um, there is a Jewish school in Casablanca, and it's a coexistence type of school, and about more than half the students are Muslim. And there's a growing Lubavitch presence within C Casablanca. So after the Megillah reading, we went to, next slide, please. We went to the Jewish, um, oops, uh, this is in, yeah, that's the next day, but we'll get back. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, I don't have that in order, unfortunately, but we went to the Jewish Social Club, which served us a kosher uh, Moroccan dinner that we had after uh, the Megillah reading. And uh, this is the this is a this is the other Jewish club in Casablanca. Casablanca is the largest Jewish community in Morocco. Morocco only has about 2,200 to 2,500 Jewish people in the whole country, and most live in in uh, Casablanca, where they have their uh, institutions uh, that are for the whole community in the country. Uh, the next morning, we left uh, the hotel and went to the um, to the visit this mosque, the Hassan the Second Mosque, as I said, the second uh, largest mosque in the Arab world. And there's a couple pictures here, and I probably have a couple pictures further on. This is the this is the minaret tower that is decorated and all inlaid with mosaics, and a very beautiful structure. And they call for prayers from this tower. Of course, it's all by loudspeakers today. This is the inside of the mosque. It's beautifully decorated with the chandeliers and areas. And we all had, of course, take off our shoes as you do in any mosque. And the areas marked uh, uh, with the stripes are the is the carpet where uh, the people pray, and this is the lines to let them line up appropriately when they do have prayer services. Uh, most mosques, you can't go in uh, and tour. There's very few. I think in Morocco, there's only two or three that you can tour. This is one of them. They have special times when they have uh, the tours and the visitors to the mosque. Um, but you can see how large it is. Uh, next slide, please. This is below the main area that we were just in. And this is the area where people come to wash their feet before going upstairs. And this is the fount that has the water for washing the feet. And I want to call your attention to the beautiful uh, chandelier or lamp that's above this fountain that's all hand tooled and hammered. Next, please. And from the outside, you see how big this is. Supposedly 35,000 uh, people can fit inside and about 50,000 in the plaza around it for prayers. And the, the mosque is directly on the Atlantic Ocean, which you can see in the background. Next, please. So after that, we went to the Jewish community. Uh, this, is, uh, the Jew, uh, this is the Jewish center uh, that's, that's there in, in Casablanca. And uh, we'll go to the next one. And like it's a big, this is the, one of the synagogues that were there in this Jewish center. And they also always had some guards around so that they were protected. Um, so next please. And because it was Purim, they had just finished the morning Purim service. You can see the table laden with goods that they used on Purim with the whiskey and the, and the, and the um, wines that they were drinking. And this happens to be the Lubavitcher rabbi that was in this particular, he's the senior Lubavitcher rabbi. And unfortunately, he passed away of COVID after the, uh, early in April. And uh, the COVID virus hit the community and the Jewish community, especially hard in Morocco. We'll talk a little bit more towards the end about that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we went next door to the bakery. 
And this is the, some of the cakes they made. And you can see the Shalach Manos baskets that were being prepared for, for them. And um, of course, everything's in French because that's the language of Morocco is French and Arabic. Basically, They're, they have other languages, including Hebrew. Um, but uh, it, we tasted some of these goods. They were terrific. And we, we had a good time eating uh, their pastries. Next, please. And this is uh, the challah that they normally bake for every Shabbat. And it, uh, this, this worker in the Jewish kosher bakery, of course, as you can see, is Muslim. So there's a big integration of people uh, in, in the community. Next, please. After visiting that community center and the bakery, we went over to the Jewish, uh, we visited the old Jewish old age home. Uh, there are currently 21 people living in this Jewish old age home. Um, many of them came from outside provinces from the, uh, from the Berber country and they came here to, to live. The Jewish community provides all the necessities for these people from healthcare, dentistry, and whatever they might need and because they can no longer care for themselves. Um, our group bought gifts for the residents. We bought bathrobes and slippers for each of them. And uh, we were given in advance the sizes of, uh, for the residents. We couldn't go into the nursing home because of COVID. We did uh, meet in the courtyard. Uh, these were some of the, this is a nurse from the uh, nursing home and some of the uh, other people who worked there that took the gifts in. And we had a talk with one of the members of the community about what was uh, happening there. Um, so uh, af after visiting the, the nursing home, next please, um, we stopped at a, at a craftsman. Actually, this is a craftsman in Fez, but you can play the little video because I wanted you to show just how this craftsman was making tagines. And, um, and it, it it was just sort of fun to watch him make the tagine as as uh, as you can see the tagines that were around him and very quickly he made them and um, they they were um, he took off the cover and he fitted to, to the base and there's his tagine then he they they baked the the ceramic pieces and uh, in a kiln and then somebody would be painting him and decorating him later on, later on. So we can stop the video, I think, David, and we'll <laughs> go on um, uh, with, with the talk next, please. So um, the, we, I, I, we, we had lunch that day in um, Rick's Cafe from the movie Casablanca. It's a tour spot, of course, and buses were there, but we had a lunch in there and it was from there uh, after lunch we traveled to Fez um, and this is uh, this is the outside of the Medina in Fez um, the word Medina is like the the shopping area the walled enclosure where stores and souks and uh, hot hot bath houses things were and next side please and right after we got to that area we went to the Jewish cemetery in Fez. Um, it's the house of the living. And there's a, a, a guard there and, you know, he accepts donations from people and as a, he's a caretaker. And it, you see the words in French as well as Arabic. And we went inside, next please. So this is one of the plaques as we came in is that, was to a man who supported the restoration of synagogues in, uh, in Fez. And they have two restored synagogues. We went into one of them. And you see the word slot, S-L-A-T. That's the word that they use for synagogue. And uh, it's, uh, you'll see that on virtually all the synagogues that we went to. Uh, next, please. So, this is just another view, picture in the, in the cemetery. And next, please. Now, the King of Morocco has spent money over the last few years to restore 167 Jewish cemeteries in the country and about uh, 
35 synagogues in the country have been restored by the king. And this, and they have basically whitewashed the tombs and, and it's very clean and, and uh, you have these things. I want you to notice is like these little niches in the tombstone. And the, the, <clears throat> the one in front of you has the words of the person, the name of the person who's buried there. These are, are above ground tombs. And then you'll see a little niche on the side where people put their Yorkshire candles uh, in memory of the deceased. Some people still leave stones here, but a lot of people light candles directly. The next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is the tomb, uh, and again, you can see these niches a lot better in this view here. So this is the tomb of Rabbi uh, Benatar, and Rabbi Benatar was the head of the Beit Din in Fez, and he was a very renowned uh, person in the city. Notice that his tomb here has a covering like a little house, which they call an ohel, and it has a chimney, and that's because so many people come here to pay respects on certain pilgrimage holidays, which we'll talk about a little later, that they have so many yurtside candles and other candles in here that they have a chimney to exhaust the heat and, and things uh, under there. Now, the story goes that Rabbi Benatar was the head of the Jewish community and the Sultan at the time wanted uh, money from the Jewish community. So he held him in prison as, as a ransom for this money. And the, the community was very, very poor and they couldn't raise the money the Sultan wanted. So he gave them one last chance and then he threw Rabbi Benatar to his lion's den that he had there. And Rabbi Benatar started praying at this lion's den and all of a sudden the lion sat down and faced him like they were his students. And for a full day and night, Rabbi Benatar prayed and the lions didn't do anything to him. And so the next day, Rabbi Benatar was let go and he's considered a saint and people come here to pray for miracles, just like uh, Rabbi Benatar has. Another tomb that we visited here, next slide, David, is this is the tomb of a young woman named Solika. And Solika was um, originally from Tangier, but was sent to Fez and she was trying to be, they were trying to force her to marry a Muslim man, and they were trying to force her to convert to Islam. But uh, she refused. And so the Sultan in Fez uh, decapitated her in 1834, and she's considered a tzaddika, a, a woman saint, and her tomb is very distinctive with its blue coloring and the ohel over her tomb. Uh, is decorated. And again, people come here, especially women, and pray. And they're not just Jewish women. They are Muslim women as well. They, they pray for certain things like child rearing and, and so forth. So um, we'll go to the next, the next slide. Uh, just another view of the cemetery, how well it's kept, uh, some of the newer tombs. Uh, of course, there's a section separate for the Kohanim, uh, rather than from the rest of the people and um, and everything. So um, most of the Jews were in three, the Jews were in three categories of people. One category was Jews who came from the Berber community. And the Jewish community in, in Morocco goes back, they, they told us that goes back to almost 500 BCE. Uh, when Jews came with uh, Phoenician traders and did gold trades and then went up into the mountains and lived with the Berbers and of course intermarried and intermingled and they actually converted a, a very large number of Berbers to Judaism. So the Berbers were uh, Judea uh, Arabs and they have their own Judea Arab language which is separate from uh, Arabic or Hebrew. Um, this, another group was the Sephardic uh, Jewish community, which came basically after the expulsion from Spain and Portugal. And a third group were Ashkenazim, who came uh, in the 1800s. So uh, it's, it's an integrated group of people. And uh, by the people's names, you can generally tell where their families originated, especially if they have uh, Berber type names. Uh, next, please. 
So after the visit to the cemetery, we went to the Ibadayan synagogue. This is the entrance to the synagogue, very nondescript except for that sign. Uh, in, next slide, please. And inside the synagogue, you see the typical, the, the lamps that were in these synagogues, the typical uh, arc and everything. And um, they're lifting up that little um, uh, trap door on the floor, and that's where the mikvah was below the, um, uh, below that uh, trap door. So it was sort of hidden. Next, please. Just our, our, our representative from the travel agency, Pam. She's amazing. And uh, we, then after leaving the synagogue, we have a chance to walk around the, the, the uh, Medina in, in Fez and see all the different products that we would see uh, from mattresses to all sorts of other things that were there. Um, next, please. This was some sides there, the, the streets were very narrow. Uh, they used donkeys and horses and push carts. And uh, we had to get out of the way for the um, motorcycles and scooters that came, came through. <clears throat> but this is the, uh, the way they, people move their goods through the Medina. Next. And you might be surprised when I could say that Morocco grows oranges and bananas. It has a climate very similar to California. Next. And of course, there's butchers with the meat here. Uh, and of course, all the meat is halal meat in the country. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's slaughtered the same way that kosher meat is. There are, there, in, in Fez itself, there are no Jewish people really living. Uh, if there is, it's just a handful. Next. Um, again, baskets, ceramic ware, these are for everybody's daily use. Uh, these are uh, things they sell to the people who live there. Next. This was just a sign showing where the synagogue was uh, going to be and uh, the area of the, uh, in the, in the in Medina. Next. Now, after visiting, <laughs> walking around the Medina, we then went to uh, a tannery and we were we walked up about three flights to be in a balcony overlooking the tannery process this goes back probably to the 11th century they still tan uh, leather the same way we were each given a sprig of mint so that we didn't uh, smell what was down there uh, but it, there you see the vats where they processed uh, the leather hides and dyed the, the leather hides the various colors Next, and of course, then of course, you have to go to the obligatory store to look at the leather goods and see if you wish to buy some of them. Um, and they had lots of different qualities from very soft to some very firm, but it was just interesting to walk through another store and look at some of the things that you could get. Next, please. Colors. The colors were beautiful. Outside of the Medina was the gates to the king's palace. Most of the cities that we went to had a palace for the king. This was his Fez palace. Uh, there were no, uh, we were not able to go inside. They didn't have tours or allow tourism inside. Uh, this is a private palace of the king. And um, the um, palace behind the walls, he has a golf course. So uh, it's just a pretty decorated with mosaics and, and things outside that we looked at. Next, please. But again, some more streets in the, in the Medina with the mules taking the goods through the streets. You can see how narrow they are and that we had to get out of the way uh, for, the, for the mules. Um, so next, next please. And this is some of the painting of the, of the ceramic pieces and in what? Glazing. Glazing of the, <laughs> yes, glazing of the ceramic pieces. And again, these were in various shops that you could buy and we would watch the craftsmen make some of these uh, art artifacts. These are interesting because of the silver that's kind right, of... Right, right. They add the silver to the glaze. Outside in the, in the, in the Medina there, that's the, some of the silver added to the 
ceramics. And outside in the Medina, there were other craftsmen. Here's a, a craftsperson making pans and pots uh, with copper. And he's hammering away on the anvil in front of him. And this is what he, he does. And he, it was a very lyrical tune that he kept pounding on these, on these pots uh, and, and copper pieces. And here's a young boy taking his mule with loaded up with the leather after the tannery to the various uh, places where they are going to be made into pocketbooks and belts and anything else that they use the leather to make. Um, next, please. And this is somebody was in a store that sold fabrics and got all dressed up in fabric items and people bought various shawls and scarves and things like that. Nice preparing for coming home. Yes. This prepared us for coming home, right. And after we, after we left uh, Fez the next day, we drove uh, in the countryside. We were in the middle Atlas Mountains. We drove to the town, towards the town of Me uh, Mechanist. And this is just some of the scenery that you see out there uh, in there. Uh, Morocco is sort of the breadbasket of Africa. They have a lot of grain they grow and a lot of crops. And you, next, please. And this was a little stand on the road I thought was interesting because of the gourds that they had displayed. <clears throat> and these are some of the scenes on the road uh, that we, we saw. Next, please. And here's the, the fields that were tilled and going way back into the, the mountains and the foothills. Uh, and even here's a shepherd with his sheep, his, his cows. And uh, it was just an interesting countryside. Next, please. We, we got uh, near the town, the city of Meknes, which had a small Jewish community at one time, uh, still has a few people still living there, was the town of Volubilis. This town was uh, a Roman city, and it goes back to probably the second or third century, and they had started excavation, the ruins here, and we walked around because there was a Jewish presence in this town, and Next, please. Um, whoops, got off. Have to get. Oops. It's, it's, okay, one more. Okay, next. This is, next. there you are. Okay, so this is Jewish presence in this town. And this is uh, a tombstone from Volubilis that had uh, Hebrew writing on it. So there were Jews present as we know for sure during the Roman time in um, Morocco. And uh, they, they were interesting. They were mostly up in the, in the mountains. They weren't along the coastline uh, at all. Next, please. Uh, th these ruins were uh, very nicely done. And uh, as you could see, um, uh, the excavations were, as I understand it, they're still excavating it here. Next, please. Another view, which was very interesting because this is a scene we not only saw in Volubilis, but we saw along the road on top of telephone poles, on top of a minaret of a mosque. We saw these big uh, nests with uh, birds. And these are stork nests. And here you can actually see the stork in the nest uh, uh, on the, on the uh, column. So we saw these quite a bit throughout our drive. Next. And this is a father and son is out in the countryside, just along the road. And they were, they, he was a vendor selling things. That's a little vendor shop next to it. And next, please. And it, in Volobulus, there were beautiful mosaics that had been excavated and cleaned. And next, please. Uh, after, after leaving Volubilis, we came towards Rabat, which is the capital of the country. And just outside of Rabat is um, the, tomb, uh, the tomb of the past two kings, King uh, Muhammad V and King Mohammed II, uh, the father and grandfather of the current King Muhammad VI. This is the guard outside the tomb. Uh, next, please. 
very colorful, like many tombs. This is the tomb. I didn't take an ins uh, side picture here, but it's very well decorated and a beautiful sight to see. And many people come to visit uh, the tombs of these kings. They were very uh, benevolent kings, not only to their country, but to the Jewish community as well. Um, one uh, King Mohammed the uh, the uh, fifth. I'm, I'm trying to get make sure I have the, the dates right. In any case, during World War uh, II, uh, remember Morocco was a French protectorate, and during World War II, um, the uh, the Germans were the Vichy France, which was occupied by by the Germans, and they came to Morocco. Uh, actually, the king invited them to come to Morocco, and he invited them for his birthday party in 1941. He had a birthday party, and he invited the Vichy French to come, as well as the leaders of the Jewish community. And he sat the Jewish leaders right next to the Germans from the Vichy France, and so the Germans got up and left. And the king was very benevolent, so that he would not allow the Vichy French government, which sort of was the protector over Morocco to have the Jews uh, sent to concentration camps or to Europe for e extermination. He, he said, everybody who's in our country, they're all Moroccans and they will stay here. Uh, next, please. Uh, we got to Morocco, we got to Rabat and it, uh, there was government activity within the, the, the center of government. So we couldn't go down uh, too close to some of the government buildings, uh, but we did go uh, to the Kasba. The Kasba is a fortified area uh, which protects, surrounds important parts of the city, um, especially some of the residential areas. And this Kasba goes back into the early 18th, uh, yeah. 18th century. And it protects uh, Rabat's on the mouth of uh, on the um, mouth of a river that empties into the Atlantic Ocean, and this uh, Kasbah protected that. Next slide, please. Um, within the Kasbah, you can see the the cannons, and within the Kasbah, there are beautiful gardens, and there's some residential areas. Next, please. Uh, we always uh, went to very nice restaurants for lunch and dinner. Uh, most of them are called riads, and these, many of them are hotels as well as restaurants, and they all opened up into a center courtyard. Uh, many of them had guest rooms up, upstairs surrounding this courtyard, and this is one of them that we had. In, next, please. Uh, this was the inside of another one here. Uh, somebody was painstakingly putting in flowers, petal by petal, decorating this little fountain at this Riyadh. This is the inside of another Riyadh we went to. Uh, we had our lunch and we were around uh, we were around the pool that was there and it was a beautiful setting. And so we, we ate very well on this trip though we did have a lot of tangines, especially chicken tangine, but but we we did eat very well and it was a first class trip. Uh, the hotels were very good accommodations and I, and I have to say that Ayala Travel did a, a really great job of putting this together. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> after after um, leaving Rabat, the next day we went to Fez, uh, to uh, Marrakesh. And this is the Medina in Marrakesh that we walked around, uh, not too much different than Fez, a little larger, a little wider uh, areas that we could walk around. But again, the, the goods were sold, very similar type of goods, crafts work uh, and household goods. Next. Here you can see the intricate works on the metal lamps that were all over. Most of them were electrified, but they go back uh, centuries to Lamp uh, lamps that held candles and uh, things like that. Next, please. As I said, we ate well. We had lots of salatines and tagines, different kinds of, every restaurant was a little different and different salads, different tagines. And um, 
it was served with wines and, and, and juices and, and drinks of all different kinds. Uh, we, we ate very well, I thought. Next, please. Uh, also in, in Marrakesh, we went to Bahad Palace, which was a palace converted to a museum. And in this palace, they had uh, Judaic uh, articles. This particular piece is a uh, jewelry from a, a, a Jewish woman, probably worn at her wedding. And they had uh, lights from synagogues, decorative lights and lamps in this Jewish museum. And it was decorated with uh, beautiful mosaics in a beautiful um, courtyard with gardens. Next. Uh, also, while we were in Marrakesh, we had uh, a chance on Saturday afternoon to go to Marjorel Gardens. This is, a, I have a couple pictures of these gardens. Uh, in the gardens, there is a museum to Berbers and in this museum, there are some artifacts from the Jewish community as well. <clears throat> so uh, another picture of the gardens. Uh, as you can see, it's a nice way to spend a Shabbat afternoon. Um, I don't have the pictures, but Shabbat morning, uh, several of us went to synagogue services in a different synagogue uh, that only had morning services. And it's called Salat Azama. Because I didn't have my camera on Shabbat, I have pictures at the end of the talk of some of the interiors that I got from uh, stock items. Uh, of the synagogue, and ta I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but next, please. But we had Arab Shabbat. Oops, this is this is out of order. Next, we'll just skip this one right now. Uh, okay, let we'll go back for just um, uh, on Sunday. We we left Marrakesh to go to the Eureka Valley. The Eureka Valley is in the High Atlas Mountains, and the High Atlas Mountains. Uh, are really high. They have elevations, I think one or two elevations are above 14,000 feet. They do have skiing. They have some ski resorts in the Atlas Mountains and uh, it can get pretty cold. This is where the Berbers lived for the most part in the Atlas Mountains and they typically had their houses made with mud bricks with straw. Next please. In their houses they kept their farm animals, uh, especially their milk cows. And next please. And there was a, a family that opened up their house to hospitality for tourists. And here's the young lady um, making us mint tea. And she mm -hmm. served some little cookies to, to all of us uh, while we were there. It's a very specific way to make right. the tea. And there, there is a very specific way to make the tea. And we had cooking lessons. We can talk about that later. But next, please. So this is an outside view of the Berber village. Some of it, as you can see, is concrete blocks, but they still use some of the mud blocks. And next is a picture of uh, a woman with her sheep uh, right on the outside of the village. And they're pretty straggly looking sheep, as you can see. But these are this is a poor area for the most part. But the Jews, uh, a lot of Jews who came early on in uh, eighth to the 12th, 14th century, this is where they went to live, was in the mountains with the Berbers. And of course, they intermarried, and there was a, a large Jewish Berber population uh, in Morocco. Next, please. Okay. In, in the Eureka Valley Mountain, there are tombs of, well, not just in Eureka Valley, but all around Morocco, there are tombs to Tzadikim, to saints. Um, this is the tomb of Rabbi Shlomo ben Hanas. And this is his tomb. It's about an hour, a little over an hour outside of Marrakesh. It's isolated. It's got a compound surrounding the, surrounding the tomb. It was protected by a Berber family until the last person in the family died. And now it's uh, protected by a Muslim woman. The compound has some rooms for guests to stay in. And she cooks kosher meals uh, for them. Of course, they pay a fee. And many people come to this tomb to pray for various miracles uh, that Rabbi Shlomo ben Hanas was supposed to uh, have done. Rabbi Shlomo was an emissary that came from Israel to the diaspora, to, to Morocco, to collect funds for the Jewish, poor Jewish people in the yeshivot in Yerushalayim. 
And I, I was growing up in, in my town in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we would often have these shlichim from various yeshivot, mostly in New York, who would come to Minnesota and go to all the businessmen in the community to ask for, um, to ask for um, uh, funds for their yeshivot. And my father would always give a few dollars to each one of them. And of course they know who to go to in the community to get the money. And it was, but this is what this man did. So in, in, the, in the middle 1600s, he was um, going through the Eureka Valley and he died. And he died right here where his tomb is. And the story goes is that after he died, some of the people wanted to steal all the money that he collected. They knew that he had money and they came to where he was and uh, they saw they couldn't get near the sacks of money because there were snakes all around and the snakes were guarding, guarding this money. And so they were afraid and he was known for the story of snakes that were guarding his body and his money. And he was known for another story where he stopped the sun, he was traveling to a town and he was afraid he wouldn't get there before nightfall. And so he was able to stop the sun setting until he could get to the town. Um, the um, uh, the community built this uh, uh, little place, and we see that we saw several places, just like in the Fez Cemetery. This is a place where people go to revere the Tzadikim, and this happens all over uh, Morocco. They have special uh, they have a special trip that they have people coming in to Morocco from. France, the United States, especially Israel for what they call halulas, and they have these halulas at these various tombs of the tzaddikim to celebrate them and to pray for miracles uh, of different kinds. And Muslims also come to these sacred spots to pray for various miracles. Next, please. Another view of, of uh, Rabbi Shlomo's tomb, and I guess his wife is buried here as well. Next, please. And this is uh, the, the cloth covering taken off and what Rabbi, it said Shlomo ben Lahanas. Next, please. And it's inside a building that's covered within this compound. These were the roads in the Eureka Valley. And of course, like the rest of it, there was people selling all sorts of things. Um, you could get ceramic wire, different things and as we drove along the valley, down below was the river that uh, supplied water that people would have to go down to to get water. Next. Just another view of a young man with a sheep and, um, and this, next please. After, after visiting the Eureka Valley, we came to a small town where we, would, we drove through, had a chance to walk from the bus and this was some of the sites in this town, the fish cellar next. And some more things on the road. Shopping. Shopping, if you need, if you miss the souvenirs in Marrakesh, you had them on the road. But this is, uh, you know, the people, so these were the, the Berber people. Uh, that name is, is not um, uh, used as much anymore because it has derogatory tones because it comes from barbarians and uh, they use the word amazing and as, uh, as, as a new term that they're trying to incorporate instead of the Berbers. But this is the Berber community. Next. Uh, again, just to show you the, the mud blocks with the straw that they built their communities in. Okay, um, so before I get into our cooking class, um, Friday night, we were supposed to go to a, a synagogue in the residential area called Bethel. When we got there, the synagogue community would not let us in because we were foreigners and not known to them and COVID was starting to increase and they didn't want to take any chance with foreigners. So instead, we went to the home of our host for dinner that night, it was uh, Isaac Ohayan, and uh, we had our Kabbalat services at his home before having a wonderful kosher 
uh, chicken dinner. And Isaac Ohayan is a, is a staunch uh, leader of the Jewish community in Marrakesh. There are only about 150 Jews living in Marrakesh. And uh, the synagogue he took us to on Saturday morning was the synagogue for uh, morning services. The other synagogue we didn't go to was the synagogue for evening services. So after we were leaving the Eureka Valley, we went to lunch at a, at a place that offered us cooking classes for lunch. And we can go through these fairly quickly, David, I think, um, as, as we come along. And some of the meals, you can see how nicely we're done. We did some of this cooking ourselves. Um, yeah. Anyways, the, 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 uh, some of the meals that we had. Um, no, this wasn't the one. No. And here is Chef Tariq, who was teaching us first how to make the special method of making Moroccan tea. Uh, and he runs the cooking school. And next, and this is we have, um, we had the, the aprons that we got from the school uh, that we had to wear uh, so that we wouldn't make messes on ourselves. Next, please. And this was our chicken tagine that we made with uh, tamarind and onions and everything. This is before we put it in uh, to the oven to cook uh, as a tagine. And, uh, you know, tagine is slow cooking. Uh, next, please. It was very good when we got done. So we left Marrakesh and we then were um, able to, um, to, we were then a able to, um, Head, head out of Marrakesh uh, to go towards, um, towards uh, um, Esaria. At, at this point, we were starting to hear more and more about the problems with COVID closing borders uh, in different countries of Europe. And uh, it was starting to get a little worrisome. And we were getting a little bit of anxiety as we were still traveling. But in consultation with the synagogue and the travel agency, we thought we would just press on until we heard otherwise about our trip. So we left, um, we left Marrakesh and headed to Esaria, uh, which was um, a town on the coast, about four hours south of Casablanca and about four hours uh, west of uh, Marrakesh. And so we had to drive there and the, uh, we, we got there on the way to the road. We stopped at an argon oil factory to watch how they make uh, the process, the argon nuts into making for cosmetics and cooking oils as well. We got into the hotel in Esaria and we heard more and more things that they were gonna close. They closed down the airports for uh, flights in and out of Morocco and uh, the borders for sea passage to Europe from the ferries. And so, the travel agency, uh, Ayala Tours, and the synagogue in Philadelphia, uh, Temple Beth Hill, got to work in trying to arrange our, our coming home. So we continued with the tour. The first thing that we saw in Esaria, again, was another Jewish cemetery. This is right on the Atlantic Ocean. There's actually two sections. This is the old section, and a newer section's uh, on the other side. But this is another one of these ohels, and this ohel was to Rabbi Chaim Pinto, who was um, in the 1800s a, a revered rabbi in Esaria. Esaria at one time was 40% Jewish and had oh, close to 30 functioning synagogues. So um, uh, about 25 functioning synagogues. So it was a very Jewish community. And again, the similar type of cemetery, this one I don't think has been whitewashed so recently, but it, uh, it was there. Um, the, uh, it, it's a multicultural city. The, the Muslims and the Jews got along very, very well. Um, so next slide, please. After leaving the cemetery, we went to the synagogue. Uh, oh, no, this was the, this was the chever of, of Rabbi Pinto. This is a sign outside indicating that this is his gravesite and some of the other prestigious rabbis that were uh, there. Um, next, please. And this is the inside of, of, his, uh, of his Ohel, and with the benches all around and the books, and people would come here and pray. 
inscriptions on the inside of the books a lot were in French. The French people came here and they, again, they pay, pray for uh, various supplications for various miracles. And uh, we prayed so that we could get out of Morocco without any problems. And uh, you know, there was a, a tzedakah box on top of the grave there, so that, uh, of the gravestone, so that we did make, leave a contribution to help. Next, please. And then we went to the Rabbi Chaim Pinto Synagogue, and he, this was just down, down a little bit from the cemetery, and it's a rest one of the restored synagogues. It's in the old Jewish uh, Mela, uh, which is pretty well destroyed here in Esaria, but next we'll go inside the synagogue and um, see how nice it's been restored and that um, uh, it's, it's freshly painted and the Torah and the Ark and things like that. Uh, next, please. There was a couple women's uh, sections around the synagogue. Uh, they had two, actually one on the third floor. This synagogue was on the second floor and they had another one behind. <clears throat> um, they had another synagogue in Esaria that had recently been uh, restored in 2017. We didn't go to that, but this was a sign uh, to, to the synagogue Lakahal. And uh, just, and by the way, the word Mogador was the old name for Esaria. Next, please. Uh, they have a Medina, and as, as do most of the Moroccan cities, and you have the same kind of scenes in Esarit of the Butcher. Next, please. And the spice marker, maker with his various spices that you can see that he sold and medicinals to different people. Um, you can even get uh, Viagra Turbo at his shop. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, Esari is a, is a fishing port. So they had lots of fishing boats, big ones, small ones that would go out into the Atlantic Ocean for fishing and come back. And they, so there was a lot of, this is a big fishing industry. They did some canning of fish as well. And it was a very colorful scene with all these boats. Um, many of the houses that were in the um, Medina were um, marked with uh, Jewish stars and things like that. It was as I said, 40% Jewish at one point. Next. A after having lunch, we went uh, to, um, we went to uh, a museum in, in, um, in Esaria. This is a reconstruction of one of the Esaria synagogues with its lamps and its uh, ark within this particular museum. It was called Beit Dakira. And Beit Dakir was is a museum that was set up uh, and for the cooperation of the Muslims and the Jews, and uh, it was it was dedicated just in January 2020 uh, with uh, the minister to the king who financed this museum, <coughs> Mr. Azoulay, and the king of Morocco was actually here. And at the end of the lecture, I've got a a magazine photograph of the king uh, dedicating this particular museum and everything. So we came here to see the, the integration of Muslim and Jewish culture in, in the city of Esaria. Next, please. Then we were able to go to Marrakesh and our airplane came to take us home. Next, please. <laughs> so. Uh, this, I have a couple uh, extra pictures here, but before we, be, before we um, got the plane, the pictures are slightly out of order, which is my fault. But we had to go back to Marrakesh. Uh, we were told by the travel agency that the plane would come to Marrakesh and take us home the next day. And uh, I do have a couple of pictures if we can, David, at the end. I don't know because it's getting up to eight o'clock. I don't know um, if we can get those back. So this is Rabbi at, this is Sh uh, Rabbi Shlomo Lahanasa's tomb, Rabbi, Rabbi Cooper, Cooper <laughs> uh, reading to us what was inscribed. Next, please. Um, this is the pic, the king is in the center, uh, reading uh, from, from a Tanakh with uh, the Rabbi Joseph Israel from the chief rabbi of Casablanca and an imam. And this is in that synagogue at that museum. And that was in January, 2020, when it was dedicated. Next. 
This is the Slat Azama Synagogue in Marrakesh that I went to for Shabbat morning services. You can see the balcony above, and this is uh, to the towards the back. And the next picture should be the Ark um, inside that synagogue. I got these from stock photos. Next, please. I got these from stock photos because I didn't take pictures with on Shabbat within the synagogue. Uh, one more picture, I think, is the last, and that is the the courtyard of the synagogue. Um, where they served Kiddush and they had some sleeping rooms above for people who were visitors, but this is the end of the pictures. I, I do have some other comments I wanna make before we finish and, and answer some questions. Um, so we, we came, went back to Marrakesh, we stayed at a hotel that was virtually empty. It was our group and a few more people that were waiting for flights out of the country. Um, we, our, we knew that our plane was gonna be on the way to get us the next, that night. And so we, Morocco started taking precautions for COVID. So we could only have room service for dinner and breakfast. And then we checked out and we could wander around the neighborhood and the hotel uh, until we got ready to leave the hotel about 6.30. And we went to the airport for our flight. There were only flights leaving Morocco. Um, most of them were charters to London, uh, to Dublin, to Rome, uh, and I think one to Romania, but there were just, there was nobody else leaving Morocco. And we were told that we were the second to the last flight out of the country. And so we're grateful for uh, Ayala Travel and, and Beth Hill Synagogue for putting all that together so that we could get our flights home. Uh, a couple notes that I wanted to mention uh, before I, I finish, and that is uh, some statistics about Morocco that I found very interesting. Um, in 19, in 19, um, in, in 1956, the, the Jews were granted, when, when France, or when Morocco got its full independence from France, the Jews were granted equal citizenship and were able to do everything that uh, other people in Morocco could do. Now, Morocco is part of the um, Arab League of Nations, and it does not recognize Israel uh, diplomatically but Mor Morocco does allow Israelis and Israeli passports to come to the country, but not, but not from directly from Israel. And of course, El Al does not fly to Morocco. So they always have to go through Europe somewheres and to get there. And, but um, they do have some cooperation uh, agriculturally with Israel and they do buy some military goods from Israel. In January, they took the, Morocco took delivery of three Israeli drones that included training of the pilots to fly them, uh, used for security on their borders. So they do have this unique relationship with Israel. Uh, also, um, uh, is, Islamic law prevails in, in Morocco, but there is also a rabbinic court that it takes care of all functions within the Jewish community, especially marriage, divorce, and inheritance laws. That's all handled by the rabbinic court uh, and is separate from the civil courts of Morocco. Another interesting thing in my reading that I found out, Morocco doesn't have an extradition treaty with Israel. And so some Israeli gangsters that have been, who left Israel because they had committed crimes have come to Morocco to live because there is a small Jewish community and they can't be extradited to Israel. So they've, they've settled there. One other thing that I found uh, um, interesting was um, that uh, in 1777, Morocco uh, made the first treaty with the new United States. And it was negotiated by an American of Moroccan descent whose name was Isaac Pinto. And today, that is the longest unbroken treaty that the U.S. has, um, is with Morocco. Uh, Morocco also teaches the Holocaust in their universities. And the main paper in Casablanca on the front heading also has the Hebrew date for the day, the Jewish date. And if it's a holiday, they'll also have the um, uh, congratulations for Purim or whatever the holiday is on the paper. So uh, that's pretty much um, uh, what I have to say uh, today. I, I could have talked a little bit more during, you know, like in Fez, 
the oldest university in the world is in Fez and in the 1100s, Maimonides came for five years to study before he went off to, to Egypt. Why the Jewish community is so diminished? Well, and yeah, okay. So in 1948, the Jewish community numbered approximately 350,000 people. When Israel became a state, people started leaving and they were organized by both the Mossad and Hayas clandestinely to leave and a, a large number, approximately 100,000 left at that point to go to Israel. And then um, after 1956, when Morocco became independent, another large group of Moroccans left the country to go to France, Israel, United States, Canada, and South America. So they, uh, so that's why the country, which was, you know, uh, 60 years ago, 350,000 is now only 2,200 uh, Jewish people. Uh, Let's see, Deb, would you have some questions? Huh? Anybody else uh, have any questions they want to ask? Or Yeah, I, I haven't seen any uh, questions come through the chat, so I'm happy to um, unmute people if there are questions that um, anyone wants to ask at this point. Shell? Yes? Can you, okay, it's Lois. Um, what about children? What what was the presence of children? Well, the, the, the families, the families still uh, who are staying there, they stay there, they're, they're, they raise their children there, there's schools for them. Uh, they do have a Jewish education. But of course, you know, it's older people who have stayed because of businesses or what other ties they have. Uh, and uh, there is a, a Chabad presence which helps educate the people. Um, so that, you know, uh, the children leave to go to different universities, they go to London, they go to France to, to get educated. And of course, you know, when children leave, they tend to stay in many of these places. They, a lot of them go to Israel because there's a, Israel's largest ethnic population uh, is uh, Moroccan Jews, uh, except for the Russians. It's the largest ethnic population in Israel, some hundred, over 500,000 People are, 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 are Moroccan descent and uh, they stick together very closely and they have a very strong feeling for the country of Morocco. And of course, with a, a king that's so um, uh, benevolent to them, uh, they have a lot of respect. Anybody else? Turn your sound off. Why the, we have a question here. Why do the uh, people of Morocco feel an infinity to the Jewish population? Um, uh, well, they, they just have because the Jews have been involved so much with the culture and the community um, that, that they just have that affinity and they just get along so very well. Um, I can't tell you. Penny. They would say, uh, the people would tell us the members of, um, when we went to have dinner at the Ohayan home, they could walk down the street in Casablanca with a kippah on their head, and people would just say hello to them, Shabbat Shalom. They cannot even do that in France. And unfortunately, it's getting more difficult in many places in the world. But in, in Morocco, it was not a problem for someone to be on their way to shul with their kippah on their head. And just be greeted. So I mean, it's it's a lot different. Um, let's see. Uh, what what did, what did surprise us most? I think the cooperation mm -hmm. of the people and how ben, uh, benevolent the king was to the people. Uh, the king has a lot of power. He's a very wealthy man. I, uh, he's multi billionaire, and he, he owns a lot of land. He owns all his his palaces, and he has, I understand, lots of cars. But uh, he's also very benevolent to the community. While there is some poverty there, um, he's been a good king for the people, especially with economic reforms in, uh, health. in health and also for people um, to be out in the community, um, in the worldly community. I'm trying to read some of these others. Um, What's he reading? No. Uh, well, the... The, um, it says the Jews did not start to leave on their own, on their own will. In 1948, all the Arab countries united and kicked out all the Jews. 
over 800,000. Morocco was separate uh, in that sense that uh, they didn't kick them out. In fact, they wanted them to stay. And that's why the, uh, the Mossad and Hayas had to, had to uh, secretly take the Jews out in 1948. Of course, they left on their own after France uh, gave the independence. But during that little hiatus, um, the king wanted them. The king wanted them. After all, he saved them from World War II. As, it, this is as I understand it. So um, the other Arab countries kicked the Jews out. Um, uh, you know, whether it was Iraq and all the other countries, or made life difficult, or, or they, those that stayed, <laughs> it made difficult. it very. It made it very difficult. The, uh, mm -hmm. Until the recent 12, 14 years until the uprising spring, there were Jews having services in the synagogue in Damascus, I know. Anybody else? Yes. Phil, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know who it is. Yeah. Um, in, you said in 56, uh, a lot more Jews left Morocco, and some went to South America and, and other places. Right. If King was so benevolent, to the Jews, why did so many people leave in 56? I think that they were looking for a long time for other things within the world. They had relatives in these places. They had a variety of reasons. I can't give you the real definitive reason why so many left, but their community was getting smaller. And so they were looking for places to go. In 56, they didn't all go to Israel. They went, a, uh, they went to France a lot. They went to uh, Spain, they went to other places, uh, Canada, uh, and, and so they weren't just all going to Israel at that time. I can understand if they were all going to Israel, but you know, to go to France and to go to... Well, because they, had, they could go to France. They could, they, they, they could go to France, they spoke French. It was easy and, for them. And weren't they like citizens anyway? Yeah, yeah and, they, and, they, and they were considered citizens of France because of the French protectorate. So it wasn't a, process, a problem of getting visas or any papers. They were French, considered French. Mm. So, so gotcha. that, that, a large number went to France. Mm. Uh, anybody else? Thank well, thank you for your attention. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Phil? Uh -huh. no? Thanks very much. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. We okay. would have David, uh, thank you very much for organizing this for me. I think it worked out pretty well. It did. It did. Thank you. Yes. It was Thank excellent. You. Thank, Thank you, Phil. Thank you. That was, Very that was wonderful. wonderful. It was, it was nice to go back to Morocco. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> That's stressful. <laughs> well, you how, less stressful. How many days from your trip did you did you lose because we of lost the... well, we lost one day because of oh, COVID. Only one day. Oh. Okay. Only one day, right? And yeah. actually, probably closer to a half a day, but one day. And do you what? have a report on the two people that were sick, especially? No, David? I, I I don't want to give any reports uh, because I don't know any current updates. What was, your was favorite, what was your favorite thing that you saw and did? <laughs> oh, there was some, well, the favorite thing is surprisingly how many Jewish people lived in Morocco and how active they were out throughout the country in these small towns that were in the mountains. They were active in the deserts. They were active in a lot of places. They influenced a lot of things that was oh, in the country. And uh, even though they were treated basically as uh, second-class citizens, uh, they, they influenced a lot of things, uh, the culture, the, uh, the education in the, in the country. And they, if you look back at the history, they had many, many tzaddikim and rabbis and teachers throughout uh, the Jewish world that came from uh, descendants of the, the tzaddikim in Morocco. And the other thing is, is that these cemeteries are quite active. There are people who are constantly coming to honor their uh, relatives in the synagogues. And there are people who are still being laid to rest in some of this, in some of the cemeteries, I mean. So that people are either, if they're very religious, making, uh, making pilgrimages, or just returning to the graves of their family members. Um, so 
and, and to think that this wedding that took place in the town of Agadir, these were French uh, people of Moroccan ancestry who live in Strasbourg in France. I mean, not even the city that I think they would be in, in the southern part or in Paris. Um, but that community came to the wedding in Morocco because it's their mishpocha. And just like when we're in another country with a small Jewish population, when there is a wedding, and even here, we went to a Nepalese wedding. And if you're a member of that community, you go. So these are very big celebratory um, events. And there is a lot of back and forth between France and Morocco, because that's where a lot of the uh, population uh, lives now. I, I just might say that COVID hit the Jewish community of Morocco very hard. By mid-April, 14 members of the Jewish community had passed away. Uh, and as from the things that I read, that was 10% of the deaths in Morocco came from the Jewish uh, community at that point. So it, it, the supposition is that the people from Strasbourg, France, came to this wedding and then went to Purim services and people were infected um, from, from that and then they were within the Jewish community. But prior to our trip, a few days before, there was a group from London that was there and several people from uh, the Jewish group from London on a tour and several people from that group. No, we didn't know. Until we didn't know until we got home, but they got sick. And even after, uh, even after the 1st of May, there was a group of Israelis that got very, very sick and lost some members of their trip, uh, people that had traveled there. So the Jewish community was hit very hard by by COVID, I hope that they have recovered. Uh, when we left, when we left the United States, uh, how many? Uh, they, 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 they had we, what three or four there cases. There was an attempt to postpone our trip, but there were many more cases reported right here in Montgomery, well, Philadelphia area, Montgomery County, than there were in the entire country of Morocco. They right. had three cases that were known, and they were people who came back either from Spain or skiing in Italy. So that was it. They said, we don't have a problem here. We have three people who are sick and in the whole country. So our trip went on and, uh, you know, we went and thank God we're here. We're well, and we can tell you all about it. No, and and <laughs> tell you all the good parts. About and, it. and I have to really say again, that uh, if you want a Jewish heritage, oh, a, people do, a company like uh, what Ayala Travel, they did an excellent job of putting it together and supporting us while we were on the tri trip along with the synagogue. And Pam always has a bag full of snacks. You're never hungry when Pam is with you. She's <laughs> okay. Thank you again for your attention. David, thanks for putting it all up together. It made it very easy. Thank you. 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 <laughs> yeah, don't don't forget Thursday night, folks. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Ira, Thursday night, we'll talk.